Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for truth. Thank you for times like this to be able to just relax and fellowship, to do this thing that matters most in our lives. Break bread, be washed over by your word. Father, we pray for those in the congregation that aren't here this morning, that you heal them in whatever way is necessary, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Bring them back to the fold in your good timing, of course. We pray for those that are still lost in this world without hope, that they be humbled, repent, receive saving faith before it's too late. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make times like this just times to be together and worship you. Just ask for blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. All right, part 52. Last Sunday, we regained our footing in our primary series. We had a couple of weeks off, remember? Um, I want to press on from where we left off. So go to Hebrews 2.1. We'll start there this morning. Um, this, is, this verse, obviously, by now you should know that it's very sticky for this congregation. Um, should be apparent by now, given the type of encouragement that's come from this pulpit on the topic in Hebrews 2.1. So Hebrews 2.1, remember this is also was one of our anchor points in the five warnings to this particular congregation, not leaving the truth behind, in other words. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. That includes the Word of God. We certainly hear echoes of that even today. That's a warning that's come from this pulpit hundreds of times, if not thousands. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. The key message from the Spirit has been this up here on the board. Stay close to the word always. That's been the net net of what the Spirit's been saying to this congregation. Uh, it's certainly uh, in the same vein as what this writer was writing to this congregation 2,000 years ago. Nothing new under the sun, nothing surprising. People get close to the word and then they have this bad habit of drifting away from it because they lose sight of their first love. So the warning has been, stay close to the word always. Whatever that means in your life, I don't know. I know what plagues me. It's when I maybe miss a day of reading my Bible and I say, dude, you missed a day. And if it's twice in a row, which is rare for me, uh, I can feel it. I know that I haven't been in the word of God. I haven't been truly washed over by it. Um, and it doesn't have to be any particular book or passage or favorite this or favorite that. It's any part of the Word. I just started reading Genesis again, and I think I was telling Sean yesterday. We saw Sean yesterday for a while. He's doing well. Uh, anytime I kind of spend too much time, um, not too much time, but a lot of time, uh, you know, on one book or another or, you know, New Testament, you know, certain doctrines there and things. My head's thinking about these things. And, uh, you know, after a while, you kind of get a little bit discombobulated. Like, I need a, in other words, I need a grounding. And whenever I get that sense in my soul that I need a grounding, I always go back to Genesis. And I read Genesis, and everything just goes. Whoosh. Because Genesis makes everything really simple. It just says, this is why the world's the way it is. Come on. Right? This is why we're in the situation we're in. Uh, and all the fundamentals of human nature are captured in Genesis. So just sharing there. But uh, we have to get and stay very close to the word always. Um, that's been the message. Why? Simply because it's the word of God that has the power to save us. When's the last time you heard that on television? Honestly. 
When's the last time you opened up your Kindle or went to the bookstore or the library uh, and saw a book that said, God's Word has the power to save you? If you want to be a better person, have a better life, go to the Word. When's the last time you've seen that? When's the last time the Bible's been on the New York bestseller list? These kinds of things, right? We stay close because it's the Word of God that has the power to save us. Not just at salvation proper, but daily. Daily. And the Spirit has a lot to say about that. So the Spirit gave us this to digest last time up here on the board. God's Word never fails. God is with us every step of the way, ensuring our salvation, not just salvation proper. And once saved, we remain saved by never losing saving faith. For example, He sends ministers to strengthen us in time of need. Last time we looked at how God sent ministering angels to Jesus after his own trials. For example, in uh, what Matthew 4, after Satan himself uh, put the screws, so to speak, to Jesus, or attempted to, and Jesus defeated him with, it is written, it is written, it is written, flee from me. And when he passed all that, God sent angels to minister to him. Now, why would we ever think that God doesn't ensure our own salvation and deliverance in time of need? Isn't that exactly what the Bible teaches us? That it's God, it's by His grace that we're saved? Go to Ephesians 2.8. Isn't that what the Bible teaches us? That this is God's doing from the start? Ephesians 2.8. This is exactly what the Bible teaches us. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Even the faith that you have is a gift from God. What's verse 9 say? Not by works. In other words, this has nothing to do with you. It's not your power. Why? So that you no, no one can boast. In other words, he wants you to understand that it's by grace alone that he saves you. Not just at salvation proper, but daily. That he makes it possible for you. Verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, go to Galatians 3.3. 3. Keep Ephesians 2.8-10 through 10 in mind. And the point that I'm making is, is it not God that saves us? Not just at salvation, but daily? Isn't it His good work in us? Galatians 3.3. 3. What does Galatians 3.3 3 say? Paul writing, related, obviously, to Ephesians 2.8-10. Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? In other words, it was the Spirit that saved you with the Word. Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? It's a rhetorical question. Paul's like, what are you trying to do? So you were saved by grace, but God's the type of God that's just going to leave you alone now, that's not going to provide for you, that's not going to save you daily, that's not going to keep you saved. It's not going to keep delivering you. That's not going to send ministering spirits even. Angels, people working on his behalf. You think that's the kind of father we have? Not even close. And that's why it's a rhetorical question. It's like, why would you ever leave the very best thing behind to go journey off, you know, lest you leave the harbor? Why would you ever leave that harbor? where the Lord has brought you in the first place. Hmm. That's Paul's sentiment. But those things are obviously related. So if we put those two verses or those two passages together, we get the simple fact that God saves us at salvation and daily. That's the point. And daily. This isn't just an academic truth. Because you could get there and say, oh yeah, the Lord saves, Jesus saves. You wear a t-shirt and it says Jesus saves and 
you're all fired up. And you, you just kind of think about it that way. Like, isn't it nice that I have a God that, quote, saves me? Look, it's necessarily, in every regard, a very practical truth that God saves us. It's not a nice-to-know academic. Am I making sense here? It's a, and that's the value of understanding what sanctification is, because a lot of people in this world say, oh, yeah, I was saved when I was 10. I mean, I have no relationship whatsoever with God, but I'm going to heaven. Yay! They miss the entire point, the practical aspect of God's love, God's grace, that it's daily. So it's not just this academic truth that's, you know, nice to know. Kind of nice to know that I'm going to be in heaven someday. And it's just somewhere back there, you know, lingering, and it's something you can look to and be encouraged. But No, no, no. This is a daily, necessarily practical truth. And that's how you have to think about God's grace and salvation. Again, the point on the board, God's word never fails. God is with us every step of the way, ensuring our salvation and that once saved, we remain saved by never losing saving faith. For example, he sends ministers to strengthen us in time of need. That's part of my job. I was sent to this congregation on this day to preach the word. Why? So that you're strengthened. I have no idea. I have ideas of what's going on in your lives. I know that a lot of you have a lot of moving parts and a lot of stress. That's why I'm here. I'm one of those elements that he has ordained from eternity past to minister to you. That's part of my job, to teach, to minister, to preach, to encourage, to exhort. And what does the Bible say? Using what? The word. Reprove, rebuke. With what? The word. Exhort with what? The word. That's my tool. That's the device. All right, back to our main verse. Go to Hebrews 2, 1. Hebrews 2, verse 1. So that's the encouragement that we've been seeing on this particular verse. We spent a lot of time on it. Uh, my guess is that it's summer, and like happens every summer, you all start drifting. And then there's a corresponding array of suffering that comes along with that drifting. And so he's basically ministering to you and saying, come back. Stop the drifting. Come back to port. Come back to harbor. Hebrews 2.1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. So continuing on now, we're going to notice how the next three verses, which comprise two closely related sentences, set up a comparison between the Mosaic law and the gospel as it was revealed through Christ in the flesh. So this is what the writer sets out to do here. He sets up a comparison. The writer is essentially reinforcing a central theme that carries throughout the book, as we noted in our contents, or context setting exercise at the outset of the series. The writer is using well-known Old Testament precepts to amplify New Testament realities. Okay. For starters, regarding the Mosaic Law, this is what he wrote. Look at verse 2, Hebrews 2.2. 2. For since the message declared by angels, now there's a reference to the law as it was delivered at Mount Sinai to Moses by angels. That would have been understood by this audience. So as soon as he said, for since the message declared by angels, in other words, the oracles of God were mediated through angels given in some way, shape, or form. Angels were present in the presentation at Mount Sinai. That's what they would have believed. That was a what we would call a cultic reality, even for Jews. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution... So let's stop there. The writer is referring to the punishment for disregarding the Mosaic law here. And he's doing that for a reason. He's saying this is the lesser, right? This is the lesser. 
if this was true, if these oracles, if the law was given mediated by angels and proved reliable and every transgression of disobedience received just retribution, and that's the lesser. What about the greater? That's where he's taking the, the thought. So the writer is referring first to the punishment for disregarding the Mosaic law. Now hold your thumb there because I want to give you proof of that. Cross-reference. Go to Acts 7.37. Acts 7.37. Just so you know the truth that this writer is drawing upon regarding Moses, what was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, and the angels. So, Acts 7.37. So this is, Luke wrote about this. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from, from your brothers. This is the one, Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai, right? And with our fathers, he received living oracles to give us. Again, that points back to Hebrews 2.2, 2, the message declared by angels. The writer also referred to this same transmission of the Mosaic law to God's people through the prophets. Look at Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, something we've already covered. Hebrews 1, verse 1, right? Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So this was a cultic reality for this audience. In other words, they, it would have been a very well-known thing to them to consider how the oracles, how the law was given. And understanding that uh, and the import of that, the way that it was given, it was given ordained by God, through uh, media, intermediaries even, um, there was a certain punishment that was related to, disobe to the disobedience of that law. So this was a cultic reality for this audience that they implicitly understood that angels were somehow involved as intermediaries regarding the delivery of the Mosaic law. Okay, go back to Hebrews 2.2. Okay. What did he say? So this is just, that's all background for this. Since the message declared by angels, so the law as it was delivered at Mount Sinai to Moses by angels, proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. So the writer reminds his audience of what we see over and over in the Old Testament, that a disregard for God's will certainly implies punishment of some sort. If you read the Old Testament, that's certainly something you're going to see. Disobey, and I'm going to punish you. And that's what we see over and over. And then, they're so crazy. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lord, it'll never happen again. I'm so sorry. And then the next passage, and then they disobeyed again. Oh, it's so sorry. It's like this waffling back and forth. It's like, come on, people. Wouldn't it have just been a little easier? Just saying. Anyways, so the Old Testament implied, the law implied, as it was intermediated through angels, implied a certain punishment for disobedience. And again, that's the lesser of the argument. We haven't gotten to the, the actual argument yet in Hebrews 2. Now, there's too much to survey on that, that particular topic, so we're not going to dig much there. Besides, I'm, I mean, I'm confident that you also understand that the Old Testament is chock full of warnings and cautionary tales of disobedience. I think I can assume that with all of you. The key point for our purposes is a relative one up here on the board. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. We're going to uh, read Luke 12, 35 to 48 here in a moment. So I want to read Jesus' thoughts on this topic. What did Jesus have to say about this to whom much is given, much is required precept? Keep in mind the writer of Hebrews' comparison 
that he's using for his audience's consumption. Go to Luke 12.35. Luke 12.35. So let's just set this anchor principle in stone here and now so that we can bring it back to our study in Hebrews and apply it in a way that amplifies what the writer was trying to say to his audience. And I've used this principle on the board a bazillion times from this pulpit. Luke 12, 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch, or in the third, and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household, to give them their portion of food, at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And then Jesus finishes with the key principle that we want to take back to our primary verse in Hebrews. Look at verse 47. That servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, that's the definition of obedience, by the way, will receive a severe beating. Let's read that again in case you missed it, in case you need a little <laughs> emphasis in your life. That servant who knew his master's will. Okay, so that's the to whom much is given part. You taking in the word of God means you understand your master's will on whatever you're taking in. And henceforth, you really don't have an excuse, do you? That servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him much will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So that's how Jesus feels about this. To whom much is given, much is required. Again, that's the point on the board. And that's how Jesus sees it. Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's the word on the topic. That's the word regarding this topic. To whom much is given, much is required. So let's take that back to our primary passage now. Go to Hebrews 2.2. 2. Hebrews 2, verse 2. Okay. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. So you have to ask yourself right now, does it make sense that if a person knows better, they get a more severe punishment than someone who's ignorant? Is that fair? 
Of course it's fair. That's why we tend to, if we have more than one kid in the house, you hold the older one typically to a higher degree of responsibility. And that's why they always get in trouble. And if you're the older one, you're like, you always yell at me more. I always get in more trouble. And what does the parent say? Because you know better. They're one or two. They're dumb. You're five or six, and you know better. And you're like, right? You're like, I guess that's true. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? So there you go. So this is not rocket science. With the help of Jesus' own words, we see that the writer was setting up a relative comparison, using the point on the board as the strength of his argument. So this is all a setup. We haven't even got to his point yet. We're just saying, listen, you remember the angels, what, the oracles they delivered as intermediate on, the, on behalf of the Lord, and you know that whoever transgressed or disobeyed that law received just punishment. That's the groundwork here. While the Old Testament saints were given the oracles of God and therefore held accountable to them lest they be punished, the New Testament saints, given the revelation of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, well, New Testament saints are held to a greater responsibility since they've been given much more. The New Testament didn't even exist for these people yet. Think about that. Old Testament saints, all they had were the oracles. We have the Old and the New Testament. We get to look back on Jesus Christ's work on the cross, his finished work. So New Testament saints are held to a greater responsibility since they've been given much more. Hence the writer's statement. Look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If the lesser was true, what about us? We know better. We know better. Jesus Christ came. We know what he said. We know better. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So hopefully you see what the writer did here. Additionally, relative to the greater context of the entire book of Hebrews, remember that he was trying to encourage them from being influenced by the Judaizers at the time. There was a, remember the, the overall theme of this book. He's trying to encourage them. And we're in the midst, we're very close to a certain set of scripture here. We're looking at it and saying, what device was he using? Right? The principle is on the board. To whom much is given, much is required. But he's also using a comparative device to make his point. And he's leveraging their existing knowledge and their cultic religious beliefs that they've drawn into um, their body of knowledge. He's using that as the baseline saying, well, if you know about this, then you know this is a much greater responsibility. You've been given much more, therefore you have a much greater responsibility. So he's trying to encourage them. It was that external group of Jews that was disturbing this local assembly by suggesting they abide in Old Testament-based perverse religious practices. In other words, to go backwards in their religion. That's what the Judaizers were trying to do. That's the kind of pressure that they were under. They were advancing as, quote, Christians. And the old school people who were still deceived were trying to pull them back. To do so, to go backwards, would be to neglect such a great salvation. For a little extra context on this, Recall the Jews thought people were saved through the law, but that has never been true. No religion, we just saw that in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, right? No religion has ever saved a person. Christ has always been the only way. Jesus himself tried to educate these same Jews but they wouldn't listen. Hold your thumb there. Go to John 5.39. John 5.39. That's the, that's the shame of this, I guess, is that 
the Messiah did come, and he told these Jews what the truth of the matter was about himself. And they didn't listen. John 5.39. He said, you search the scriptures, the oracles, the law, because you think that in them you have eternal life. That somehow the written word, the religion, the perversions, all of that gave them eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. In other words, salvation is through a person, and that person is me. And you refuse to come to me that you may have life. That's what Jesus said about this Jew, Jewish religion. Again, no one has ever been saved by keeping the Mosaic Law. In fact, Paul wrote a bit about this same topic worth reviewing. Go to Galatians 3.21. Galatians 3.21. You don't, you're not saved by keeping the law. Let's put it that, well, it's impossible for you to keep the law. But we'll get that in a moment. And that's what Paul was saying in Galatians 3.21. He said, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Ah, so we see a shift here. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith could be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian. Some of you might have tutor or schoolmaster in your translations. It depends on the English translation. So then, the law was our guardian, our tutor, our schoolmaster, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith, not by some vain attempt to keep the law. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. How? Through faith. Faith alone in Christ alone is what saves a person not religious adherence to the law. Paul complimented Jesus' words regarding the purpose of the law. And I just want to oversimplify the law for this message. Regarding the purpose of the law, we might say that it was given to prove to the Jews and all that they could never live up to God's holiness without his explicit help. That's what the law did. Just said, you're always going to be a sinner. Here's the law, and because I gave it, it's perfect. Nothing wrong with it. May it never be. But I hope you realize by now, you'll never keep it perfectly. What did Jesus say? Even if you lust after another woman, men, in your brain, you're an adulterer. Now, I'm not going to ask any man here that's ever been married to raise their hand and say, oh, I've never done that, because that's ridiculous. So I guess we all broke the law already. We didn't even get out of the gate. Ever lied? Ever cheated? Ever done anything? No one can ever live up to God's holiness. And the only way you can have eternal fellowship with God is if you're perfectly righteous and perfectly holy and blameless. And completely clean. You don't get into heaven otherwise. That's the whole point. No one ever, except Jesus, can live up to the law. That's all the law should be in your mind nowadays. Especially since you're no longer under it. Keeping the law perfectly was impossible except for Jesus. And just for you ex-Catholics, and you religious folks out there, you ready? There's no 
uh, good enough. Well, I know, I know, he is the law, but, you know, I'm pretty close. And I think God thinks I'm a pretty swell guy. And because I'm a pretty swell guy and I mean well, and I'm this close, he's just going to, you know, he's going to give me a little bonus credit and I'm going to get into heaven anyways. Because I'm good enough. There's no such thing as that. So throw that in the garbage up here on the board. James, Jesus' brother, wrote this, 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Hold on. There you go. Someone trying to get in touch with me during the message. <laughs> People out of control. You get the point? One, one transgression. And you fall below perfect righteousness. One. That's the point. There's no way of achieving perfect righteousness outside of God's grace. It's literally impossible for us. All right, let's get back to our primary passage now. Go to Hebrews 2.2. 2. Hebrews 2.2. 2. For since... Hebrews 2.2... 2, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, that's the lower responsibility in, in view, how shall we who have been given much more responsibility, much greater revelation through Jesus Christ, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great Salvation. So that really amplifies a warning here. And recall our anchor principle up here on the board. To whom much is given, much is required. And Jesus said it very succinctly in Luke 12, 35 to 48, as we read. So the writer here uses the backdrop of the Old Testament, specifically the Mosaic Law, to prove his point. In the grand scheme of the book, he's making his case as to why, and I'll borrow from Hebrews 2.1, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. So he's making sure they understand the severity of being responsible to a greater revelation. He's using that as sort of the, 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 the emphasis, if you would. Uh, and then he's using that as the backdrop for his encouragement. Why we must pay much closer attention to what we heard, lest we drift away from it. So the writer's encouraging this congregation to stay the course. Not just for the positive benefits of doing so, but specifically here to avoid the punishment of not doing so. In other words, all the good stuff is staying the course, staying in the harbor, staying near the Word of God. That's where all the goodness happens. If you drift away from it because you start forgetting about the Word of God, you lose your sight on your first love, all the bad things start happening. So in this case, as it pertains to salvation, the consequences of defecting from the Christian faith are utterly catastrophic. The writer is saying, you've been given so much as a New Testament Christian, don't make the mistake of walking away from it. A so great salvation. Your punishment will be all the more severe. You will be, receive a severe beating. A severe beatdown. As a side note, remember from our context setting messages that this writer, like any pastor, was fearful that some in the congregation 
would apostatize. Apparently, as we studied previously, some already had. There's always that fear. I have it right now. That someone in here, like has happened how many times? I don't even know. Will leave the faith. That will apostatize. That as I was teaching them charitably all this time, the truth of the matter was it never stuck. They were like one of the soils that weren't good. And say, what is it, Matthew 13. <clears throat> right? And that really bums out a pastor. There's a real fear there. It's visceral. You don't want to see that. But then there's the lesser case as well, the general case for believers, which is they drift out to harbor and they suffer for it. Neither one of these things are things that a pastor that loves his congregation wants to even have to think about. It's terrible. So let's read the whole passage again to pull this all together. Look at Hebrews 2.1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. This is his encouragement. And then he gives that emphatic comparison. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution... The lower case, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? As I alluded to earlier, this concept supports the overall theme of the book of Hebrews, namely to encourage his, this audience to stay the course, to remember their first love, to stay close to the word, to read your Bible. What does that mean practically? To read your Bibles daily, to meditate on it to pray to God, to do all this stuff. Don't just play the game. Don't just go out alone. Go at it alone. Don't go think you can, you know, test the waters out there on your own because you can't. You're too weak. You need God's grace. He saved you at salvation proper, and he saves you daily. If you want to be delivered from whatever is agonizing you, I think I said this last week, then it's the word. You're in the right place. You're in the very best place at this moment in time, being preached the word of God, being encouraged, exhorted, rebuked for some of you. It's the right place to be. It's what keeps you as close as possible to the truth, to the word of God, to your first love. That's what this pastor was saying. That's what I'm saying. So let's... let's quickly see where else the writer reiterates that what we're seeing here in chapter 2 so far go to Hebrews 10 28 Hebrews 10 28 he's saying st stay in the harbor because things get really painful outside things are not good when you turn your back on the Lord this is a theme that he carries throughout this book not just here Hebrews 10 28 Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Okay, so that sounds pretty severe, right? I mean, you die? You, get, you mean you get put to death? Yeah, they killed you. Okay, so that's your baseline. Think of Hebrews 2, 2 and 3. The baseline was the price, the punishment for disobedience. How much greater if you neglect salvation? A great, so great salvation. He's saying the same thing here. It's the same setup. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? You see? Before they didn't know him yet. We do. This congregation did. They knew who Jesus was. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. 
And then the next one is maybe the most ground-shaking, scary thing to think about. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That one scares me. Like, it's kind of like he's going, you don't want Dad to go like this. Come here. And you get to look. And it's God. He goes, now you got my attention. We're going to settle this here and now. I don't know. I got goosebumps right now. That stuff scares me because it's the Lord. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering. So he gets, he makes his point again, same thing. But then he gets to the encouragement bit, which is nice. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. But you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. So following the warning comes the encouragement, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, obeyed, versus disobeyed, obeyed, you may receive what is promised. It goes back to Galatians 6, 7, right? God is not mocked. You reap what you sow, and that is a bi-directional truth. It's just a black box, if you want to call it that. You do good, good things happen. Bad, bad things happen. Right, Mom? Yeah. That was a thing she used to teach her grandkids. Listen, kids. If you're good, good things happen. If you're bad, bad things happen. Did you tell You taught all the grandkids that, right? Hmm. One more place where we see the writer reiterate what we've been noting in chapter 2, Hebrews 12.25. All we're doing here is establishing the main theme. Go to Hebrews 12.25. There's a theme throughout this book. Hebrews 12.25 See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Be careful. Listen to what you have heard lest you drift from it. Is it the same thing? Same language, right? Same idea? He keeps reiterating it throughout the book. We saw this in the context setting exercise, right? It was really, this entire book is about encouraging people to stay with their first love. Who is the Logos, capital L? Who is the Word? Stay with Him. See that you do not refuse Him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, a reference back to the law, much less will we escape if we reject Him who warns from heaven. All right, let's close with one final reading of our primary passage. Hebrews 2.1. I hope you see what the Spirit's saying here. Again, to whom much is given, much is required. You've been warned. Salvation proper for someone who's not yet saved. Salvation on a daily sense. These both things are in view. It's best to stay Close to the word, lest you drift from it. Hebrews 2 1, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we, who know better, who have more, escape if we neglect such a great salvation? I know these are lofty concepts that we've covered here this morning. There's a lot to digest, so please do yourself a favor and plan some time aside today to meditate on these things. That's another thing that he keeps saying from this pulpit. Don't, please, don't just leave here and say, well, that was fun, and I got some quiche and some <laughs> sugar bombs, right? And I can go, go into a food coma at home and a sugar crash afterwards, right? 
Don't do that. Like, that's gross. You're given pearls here this morning. Like, relish them. Look at them. I mean, if I gave you an actual pearl, you'd probably spend an hour with it and wonder how much it's worth. What does the Bible say? That stuff's junk. It's garbage compared to the truth, the value of the word. Buy from me, he said. Gold refined by fire, right? All that other stuff pales in comparison. He's talking about his word. Spend your time, your energy, even your money to get and purchase those things. I forget the, where that parable is, but what about the guy who f- finds a pearl and sells everything to buy the whole field? That's how our attitude should be. This is as good as it gets. So please, that's my plea for you this morning, my pleading. Take some time. Set it aside like real time. And meditate. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for truth that sets us free. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families, and your will be done to a world that desperately needs the truth, Father. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.